Matthew 7.33. So, okay, once again, uh, back home, it was uh, seventh grade. That's when I switched over. And uh, so anyways, so that one, Kreisel was one, one guy's name. The other biology teacher's name was Hahnemann. They were fierce. And uh, the reason they were fierce because they, they demanded respect. And uh, when you when kids would go out after the you know the breaks, go out onto the uh, what you call this the uh, uh, the back of the school you know where you spend fifteen minutes or then the larger breaks a half an hour. You know you drop something you pick it up. But when these guys showed up, when they just stepped out of the building, it doesn't matter what kind of a rascal you were, you would automatically look around you, probably in about five feet. Uh, diameter just to make sure there's nothing on the ground because if there was something and they w walked up to you they would take you on your sideburns all the way down to the ground and you would pick it up you also would uh, spend endless times in the <coughs> school garden after hours either just putting you know manure in it or mixing manure or weeding so these guys they were very well respected and Kids were actually afraid of them, but uh, in the in the later years, in my last uh, two years in school, when we actually got one of the guys as biology teacher, <clears throat> the first day of school in his class, you could see all the back would fill up. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wanted to sit in the front, and so he's standing there just laughing because he was pretty tall, and uh, and by the way, they they were teachers under Hitler, but then they con basically. Uh, they agreed with the, the new socialist order, and they, you know, were kind of rolled into that. They said, okay, that's, you know, we didn't really care for the Nazi uh, regime and everything that went down. And so they were basically implemented into the, the socialist system. That's how they were, you know, and many of them were, because they wouldn't have had any after 45. But so as he saw filling up all the back room in the next door, in the next door, nobody, <laughs> nobody's in the front. He said, yep. He said, in the movie theater and in war, the best places are always in the back. And so, <laughs> so, so he said, okay. He said, Fritz was my buddy's name, Kallenbach in the front, because we were pretty well known <laughs> so, for being a little bit, you know. What I did was just drag the podium to the back of the classroom. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't, because that was all screwed down. So and that, you know, But it was just neat to see. But like I said... Um, these people actually had the best interest because they would teach the kids, you know, you've got to be respectful and there's a reason why we do certain things the way we do them. And it helps you just in life too. Today, I mean, you have people standing right in front of you. Heck, I see them in the grocery store. They unpack something and throw it on the ground. Yeah. Even though the trash can is right there. And they walk out. That's all part of uh, part of the, the system that is kind of... Uh, Lacking morality and everything else that goes with it. So, well, you, you not only learn respect, but you also learn grit. Yes. Yes. And these guys, when you, if you actually did your homework and uh, you participated, um, they actually were really cool, these guys. And they really had your, your best interest. Well, you don't know that if you just, uh, you know, Go by the myths and uh, we know what people tell about and and yes, they would reach over. They uh, they had a long a long stick that was probably about I kid you not six feet, and the guy would sometimes bang on it. <laughs> people would wake up, <laughs> or he would get you the first two rows. He would reach easily, so he get a little nudge. That was cool. Anyways, yeah, that was funny. All right. Catholic school. Yeah. They had a pointer that had was made out of oak, had a, had a rubber tip on it about this long. Wow. Oh. If you were caught talking or or uh, good old Catholics, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and that went along with five hundred Hail Marys, probably. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, uh, Father, we thank you. 
Thank you, Father, for this evening. Thank you for the gathering together of your saints, Lord, tonight. Father, we thank you for your Son, specifically Jesus Christ, who endured a lot so that we can sit here tonight freely. We can sit here tonight to worship you by the studying of your word. We can sit here tonight to receive your word freely, Lord, for all that you have done for us, Lord. That we as Barabbas, uh, we pointed out, just uh, were switching places, Lord. We the ones deserving all this condemnation, all this mockery, reviling, and uh, the beating, Lord. But you took it in our place. So, Father, we are so grateful, eternally grateful. And, Father, we just uh, want to open our hearts tonight that your word would sink into our hearts, that you would prepare it to bring forth the fruit that you expect from us, Lord, according to your word, according to the talents that you have given each and every one of us. But also, Lord, that uh, our hearts would be prepared to receive that word correctly, Lord. So, Lord, uh, we just ask you that you would bind the enemy right now. Give us the peace and understanding that we need, not interrupting in, in thoughts or feelings in any metaphor or shape, but, Lord, that we would be focused like a laser beam on your word, what is said tonight, Lord, that we can take it, eat it, the manna from heaven, and, Lord, and digest it in the the hours and days and weeks to come should you tarry, Lord. Father, help us to be obedient servants of you, Lord. Putting aside our excuses, our murmuring, whatever it is, Lord, and to grow up, Lord, into the fighters that you want us to be, Lord, the soldiers of the cross that you created us to be, and you surely have given us every single element to be that, Lord. It is up to us to take hold of him, to invite your Holy Spirit daily, and to walk with you every single day, Lord, until you decide to call us home. So we thank you, Father, as we open your word now. Bless it and bless our time together in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> It has been rightly said that we live in a time where the Word of God is not taken seriously anymore, where the Word of God is not respected and valued any more long or any longer in general. It is also said, or it is sadly true also for or in many of our churches today. The word inspired by the Holy Spirit is often watered down. It is replaced by stories or personal anecdotes rather than letting the power of God's word speak for itself so it can penetrate our hearts. It can convict us, convict us of our spiritual laziness or our lukewarm relationship with the Lord. And our disobedience to the commandments and then not only cleanse us restores and redirect us but also strengthen us draw us nearer to him and ready us for the work that is at hand and always be reminded of uh, hebrews 4 12 you probably all know the first couple of verses in it but uh, it's always important to take a few more of it and i read it to you because that is what is given to us, that's what it is commanded to do in us by the Holy Spirit, and that's what it will do if we allow to do it. So for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But that's not all. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not serve a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tested as we are, and probably beyond, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have everything given to us, especially the word, the powers in the word, we know that. There's never anything wrong with the seed. If there's anything wrong, then it's with the soil, and that's usually the hearts. And we've got to make sure that we keep on plowing the sorts of our hearts and those people that we want to touch, those people that are put into our paths and lives that need to be touched, you know, whether it's family members or not, whether it's people we, we do know, uh, you know, occasionally or strangers, it doesn't matter. The Word of God, it says, will never return void. If we live by it, if we use it, and if we obey it. We're all familiar also with another piece of Scripture, which is John 3.16. John 3.16. And I believe it's very similar to what I just said, that... Uh, was in regards to Hebrews 4.12. We know the first few lines, but what about the rest that follows? Which is not just a sobering, has not just a sobering effect, but also has a good warning. That we should read these through or memorize them even better. And it says there in John 3.16, um, that God so loved the world, exactly, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Correct, that's how it starts, and that's what most people are familiar with. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then it continues, you, and this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. You look at today around what is going on in our country and the world, they don't have anything to do. In fact, a few years back, remember, there was one party that even took the name of God out of their whole convention. They put it back in, but regardless whether it was in or not, the fact that they don't believe in it. Anyways, but that's where we are, and that's exactly why. That is the reason, because they love darkness rather than light. And all the deeds do you see is according to that. But he who does the truth, and hopefully it's all of us, comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they may have been done in God. See, and this is the warnings, again, that... Uh, the scriptures giving us, and there's so many more, I just point some out because they're well known. Some of them we hopefully use often, not just on us, but also as we pray, as we talk to other people, as we partake of their lives as well. Because remember, it's never about us. If we are saved. From now, from that point on, it's all about those people that are struggling and those people that are not saved and those people that need our help and so on and so forth. So we better take heed of these warnings that the Lord is giving us and not brush it off the table and then having to deal with the consequences. And you know, the Lord is loving and he's fair and he's forgiving, but it can take the rest of your life to deal with the consequences. As we saw, for instance, in, in David's life. 
All right, by not taking or receiving God's word in or at its full strength, we at the same time minimize also the power of the cross. And that's what the enemy is after. Always trying to kind of paint over the cross because the power is in the cross. If it wasn't for the cross, it wouldn't be here, right? And so you see this either from very liberal uh, religious people that are, that are studying the Bible, theologian, whatever you want to call them, whether you see it from the enemy in general of the unbeliever, but they don't want to talk it in nothing to do with the cross. That's why for years and years this campaign throughout the United States taking down crosses, whether it's Mount Soledad in San Diego, wherever it is, even in private properties, you know, it's just uh, constantly, it's against the cross, and that's what the enemy does. Because if they can minimize the power of the cross within us, then we become more powerless because we are not really holding fast and, and, uh, and taking our strength from that what the Lord has accomplished for us, you know. And so from Genesis 3.15 through the entire scripture, we see God basically declaring war against Satan. And we see on every page of scripture until the seed of the woman that is mentioned in Genesis 3.15, which is also known the Proto-Evangelicum. That's the first time the gospel is mentioned, basically. Until we see the seed of the woman manifested in Jesus Christ. We learn of the Passover that God introduces in Exodus until we see Abraham offers up Isaac in Genesis 22. On the very spot where the ultimate Passover lamb would be sacrificed. Same spot. And so we are reminded by the pages of scripture that the very fine line that is found between the words always speaks of the cross. Everything is pointing from the Old Testament until basically Christ is crucified towards the cross. And then from that time on, it points back to the cross. So Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 1.18, another scripture you're probably familiar with, and uh, just going to mention it again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's two camps. We either believe that the cross is foolishness or it is the power of God in our lives. We make the decision. And so are those people that are outside of our circle. It's the same thing when you look in the world. Two camps, there's nothing else. And so... What are you saying? That it's the power of the cross or the power of God that... Well, if you don't believe in the power of cross, then that is all foolishness to you, and you perish. That's what it is. But to us, the power of cross, the power of the cross, is basically uh, the the baseline that we have in our walk with the Lord. We know that we can draw from that. We know what was accomplished there, and that it was basically the highlight, if you will, from the. Uh, culmination of the Old and New Testament coming together at that point. You know, because that was it. That was the reason Christ came. That had to be established. And it was through the cross. And we'll see for what reasons as we get into it now. So as we continue our study, uh, we will implement again some of I'm going to jump a little bit back and forth, but especially... In John 19, which is the parallel passage of what we are reading, he's just giving us a little bit more information that helps us to put the puzzle together, to shed more light on it, uh, whatever you want to call it, but uh, to complete basically the account we are reading here in, um, in Matthew. So in John, John's account, parallel to Matthew, and I'm in John... Um, Parallel to Matthew 27, I'm going a little bit back because we were there last week already. 
27, verse 28 to 31, and that parallel passage is in John 19, verse 12 to 15. And I didn't uh, talk about that, but I want to do it now quickly because it is an incredible piece of information that we should know. That's okay. And it tells us actually what where these Jewish, uh, but these Pharisees are actually the Jewish leadership is coming from. In John 19, 12 through 15, it says, From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, cried out, Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Do you realize what they were saying? With that just one sentence, we have no king but Caesar. The Jewish leadership just renounced their entire history and all that God had done for the nation of Israel in one sentence. I have a question. So does that mean they're speaking for the whole nation of Israel? Well, they, they're supposed to. Of course, we know they are already, they are crooked. It doesn't matter. But... What they're saying is, you know, it's always, you're, you're looking, it's just like in our government, you have the leadership, we not all agree, but usually the leadership is, you know, the, 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 the values of people, that's, we're supposed to be in a, in a democracy, and I don't want to go off, get off the script here, but uh, the, the way people live, the moral values, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is always, the leadership always reflects that of the people. So if the people are bad, the leadership is bad because somebody get them in there, right? And I'm talking about the democracy. But the other way around, it's the same thing. This is not a democracy, but uh, it's supposed to be, you know, some type of a theocracy close to it. I mean, Christ is not reigning, but they are living off the scripture, which is God's word. They should know it. And therefore, they are speaking for the nation of Israel. That's the position they have been given. And so if they say, and they were not the only ones crying that, but uh, obviously as the Jewish leadership, they said, hey, we have no king but Caesar. But nobody said anything. Nobody. Blasphemy. Yeah, exactly. So they are renouncing actually as the leadership, as the high priest, regardless now if they were already corrupted or not. But what they are saying is just incredible. And that was prophesied, actually, in Hosea 3, 4. And again, we are once reminded that the, 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 the prophecy of Scripture never fails. It's always right on time, right on the money. It says in Hosea 3, 4, No, it's not in Hosea 3, 4. <laughs> I made a mistake. It was in... Ooh. I must have made a mistake when I wrote it down. It's in Hosea, but I didn't know where what I did with my line there so I have to find it out for but it is prophesied there in Hosea I just have to find it where it was anywho my mistake was it three, 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 three. no nope, I find it I find it later for, for uh, find out for you so so in John's account parallel to Matthew 28 uh, 31 was basically that what I didn't 
catch on last time, and that's why I just squeezed that in now, which had to do with that particular passage. And so, we continue in Matthew 27 now, 33, 34. So when you, every time, every time you come across it, you will realize what these people said there was actually not just a few words they, they cried out there, the leadership, the high priests, to Pilate, but that was uh, a denunciation of actually what they, what they actually stood for, what he was supposed to stand for. So we're back to Daniel 27, 33, and 34, and uh, we continue. After the Simon of Cyrene actually was picked out by the Roman guards there to carry the cross for him, and when he had come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, that they, gave, that they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Now is that Daniel what? No, that we're back in, uh, in Matthew 30, yeah, 27, 33. So there was a specific place outside the city, the city walls of Jerusalem, where the people were crucified. Golgotha, or the place of the skull, because the hill itself, at one point in time, had a skull-like appearance. But probably today when you go there, because of the erosions of the centuries, you probably don't see it, you know, what it at one point looked like. But nevertheless, the location of Golgotha was, of today, uh, what today Golgotha is, is at the peak of a ridge system, which is called Moriah. And I just kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. Mount Moriah gives you an idea because that is exactly is the same spot where Abraham took his son Isaac, where the Lord told him to sacrifice him, basically, you know, offer as a sacrifice. Now, and wasn't, that wasn't the tomb at the bottom of that hill? Yeah, the tomb is. Yeah, we get to that too. Yes. So Abraham offered his son basically two thousand years earlier, exactly on the same spot. And it's interesting when you look at the topographical map. That very peak where Golgotha is, it is 777 meters above sea level. Three times seven. Interesting. Now, let's review what the Old Testament said actually and how that all lined up about where the sin offerings were to take place. It says that, that the burn offerings and all sin offerings were supposed to be done on the north side. Leviticus 1.11 and Leviticus 6.25 tell us that. Specific. It also tells us in Leviticus 4.21 and, 4, 4, and 16 that it was supposed to be outside the camp. And then if you go into the rite of Hebrews, he speaks of the suffering or crucifixion of Jesus outside the gate. And that's all where Golgotha is located. It is on the north side. It is outside the gate, outside the camp. So it all goes in hand with what the Lord actually already put in place back in the Old Testament. Now, Golgotha in Latin means Calvary. Luke 23, 33 actually speaks of the same passage. He calls it Calvary. We call it Golgotha here. And it's, again, a place where criminals were crucified. As a place of cruel, humiliating death, it was outside the city walls, yet likely on a well-established road because the Romans wanted to make sure that any traveler, anybody who came from some other area, country, region, would see and make sure and be warned that the Romans were not running a cheeky Mickey system, that they were dead serious about everything. Wasn't, wasn't Golgotha where they did sacrifices of the animals too? 
I thought, because that was out, down outside. Was, the oh, yeah, uh, the sin offerings, exactly. The sin offerings had to be outside the camp. Yes, from the Old Testament, yeah, absolutely. And so, now that brings us to 27.35 in Matthew. We're back in Matthew 27.35, the first part. And it says there, and then they crucified him. Just right there. And then they crucified him. It's significant to remember, and we mentioned that before, the last couple of teachings, that Jesus did not suffer as a victim of circumstances. He was at any given time in absolute control of all things. John 8, 10, 18 says, No one takes it, speaking of his life, from me, but I lay it down of myself. I'm going to read to you uh, like I did briefly last time, there was a medical report that was written in 1986 by Dr. William Edwards. So we mentioned last time that crucifixion didn't originate with the Romans, it originated in Persia. And uh, from the fact that the earth was considered to be sacred to Ormuz, the god, and the criminal, the criminal was lifted up from it, that he might not defile the earth, which was God's property. That's what they, Persian thought back, back in the days. Before I go on, I want to read that to you. So just once again to bring to mind, because we read crucifixion, we read scourging, we don't realize what took place. He would... In an article in a prestigious uh, journal of the American Med Med Medical Association titled On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ, following are some observations of Dr. Edwards and his associates. The quotings belong to the article and much of the other text is paraphrased from the article. Again, although the Romans did not invent crucifixion, the, they perfected this as a form of torture and capital punishment that was designed to produce a slow death with maximum pain and suffering. The victim's back was first torn open by the scourging. That's what we went through last week or a couple of weeks. Clotting blood came off with the clothing that was removed at the place of crucifixion, which we will see here in a minute. When thrown on the ground to nail the hands to the crossbeam, the wounds were again opened, deepened, and contaminated with dirt. With each breath attached to the upright cross, the painful wounds on the back scraped against the rough wood of the upright beam and were further aggravated. Driving the nail to the wrist severed the large median nerve. This stimulated nerve-caused bolts a fiery pain in both arms and often resulted in a claw-like grip in the victim's hands. Beyond the severe pain, the major effect of crucifixion inhibited normal breathing. The weight of the body pulling down on the arms and shoulders tended to lock the respiratory muscles in an annihilation state that thus hindering exhalate Exhalation. The lack of adequate respiration resulted in severe muscle cramps, which hindered breathing even further. To get a good breath, one had to push against the feet and flex the elbows, pulling from the shoulders. Putting the weight of the body on the feet produced more pain, and flexing the elbows twisted the hands hanging on the nails. Lifting the body for the breath also painfully scraped the back against the rough wooden post. Each effort to get a proper breath was agonizing, exhausting, and led to a sooner death. Not uncommonly, insects would uh, light upon the burrows into the open wounds or the eyes, ears, nose of the dying and helpless victim, and birds of prey would tear at these sides. Moreover, it was customary to leave the corpse on the cross to, do be, to be devoured by predatory animals. Death from crucifixion could come from many sources. Acute shock from blood loss, 
being too exhausted to breathe any longer, dehydration, stress-induced heart attack, congestive heart failure leading to cardiac rupture. If the victim did not die quickly enough, the legs were broken and the victim was soon unable to breathe. A Roman citizen could not be crucified except by direct order of Caesar. It was reserved for the worst criminals and lowest classes. No wonder that the Roman statesman Cicero said of crucifixion, quote, It is a crime to bind a Roman citizen. To scourge him is an act of wickedness. To execute him is almost murder. What shall I say of crucifixion? crucifying him, an act so abominable it is impossible to find any word adequately, adequately to express. End quote. The Roman historian Tacitus called crucifixion a torture fit only for slaves, fit only for them because they were seen as subhumans. How bad was crucifixion? We get our English word excruciating from the Roman word out of the cross. Consider how heinous, how heinous sin must be in the sight of God when it requires such a sacrifice. So that gives you an idea basically what happened to somebody hanging on the cross. And remember when ISIS started going all over the place again, they basically did that again to the Christians. You saw, I saw quite several Towns and cities, people just hanging, crucified, you know. Well, wasn't there it, crosses all along the, the main road? Yep, all the way. The, the people that were crucified were just left there? Yep, yep. Then they crucified him. It is significant to remember that Jesus did not suffer as a victim of circumstances. It's terrible to be forced to endure such torture, but to freely choose out of to choose it out of love is remarkable. He wasn't forced, he chose to be beat and he chose to be crucified. There's a question, can we ever rightly doubt God's love for us again? And I think we all have to agree that whenever we even just murmur about something so insignificant, that we should always look at the cross. Has he not gone to the most extreme length to demonstrate that love. Now it is said in verse 34 that they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink it. It was a customary procedure to give those about to be crucified a pain-numbing, basically, or mind-numbing drink to lessen their awareness of the agony awaiting him or awaiting them. So that's why they usually gave it to them. In the Greek language, gall and myrrh are the same. So that's what it was made out of. Myrrh was used as a narcotic. Myrrh was also very expensive. Well, e Exodus 30 says... It was used to anoint prophets, priests, and kings as it was mixed into a holy anointing oil. They, when they made that special oil to anoint priests, prophets, and kings, myrrh was an ingredient in that. Did, Psalm, didn't the wise man... Yes, I get to that. Earth? Psalm 45 refers to it as a perfume. I get right there. I get right to it here. Yeah. You're just jumping two lines ahead. And John 19 tells us that it was used also for embalming. And so that brings us back to what uh, Doug just pointed out. At Jesus' birth in Matthew 2.11, 
he was given myrrh. Prophet, priest, and king. But there's some other reasons too, because he was the anointed one with a capital A. Because his name is as ointment poured forth as the Song of Solomon describes in 1 verse 3, and because he came to die. So these are your parallels there. He is the anointed one. The ointment was poured forth as the Song of Solomon describes, or as we had the story, would the expensive ointment be poured on his you know, feet? And he came because he came to die. Now the sour wine, or pasca, P-O-S-C-A, was used by the Roman soldiers. In Mark we read that Jesus declined the mixture, desiring to suffer with a clear mind. And so, in verse 27, we continue then, uh, uh, Matthew 27, 35b, or next part, and divided his garments. So they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So, they divided his garments, casting lots. When we look at this now, as Jesus is hanging there, the Lord came all the way down the ladder to accomplish our salvation. He let go of absolutely everything that he had, even his clothes. He was nailed to the cross as a naked, humiliated man, becoming completely poor for us so we can become completely rich in him. I hope that we all come to the point and understand actually what we have. I think it was Mother Teresa I said, she said one time, people will never know that Christ is all they need until Christ is all they have. And so it says that it might be fulfilled. It seems that Jesus has no control over these events, yet the invisible hand of God guided all things, every detail, even through the crucifixion, so that specific prophecies were specifically fulfilled. Each Jewish male wore five articles of clothing. They had a headband, they wore sandals, they had an inner cloak, which is a sort like a nightshirt, if you will, a belt, and then the outer tunic or the outer rope. The soldiers divided Jesus' clothing among themselves, but when it came to the outer tunic, the outer garment, they threw dice to see who would get it. Why? Because John 19.23 tells us it was without seam. It was a very fine, well-made piece. In John, John 19.23. And then again, to fill, fulfill prophecy, which is Psalm 22.18, what is spoken of that. And sitting down, they kept watch over him. And this was probably to prevent that someone would come to rescue the Lord from the cross. Because obviously the Jews made very clear with all their, you know, talking to Pilate and... Uh, Mary, firstborn 
son the mother made a one piece garment for them? I'm thinking of you talk about the outer garment. It could be. Not necessarily because well, it could be. I do not know on that. And so we read in verse 37 then, and he put over his head the accusation written against, uh, written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. It says once again in John 19, 19, that peril passage, that actually Pilate wrote that himself. He didn't have it written. He wrote it himself. It seems that Pilate was fluent in three languages. He was fluent in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Latin, of course, the official language of the Roman Empire. And that was Pilate's epitaph. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The written charge was normally carried before the criminal on the way to the execution. Or it was hung around on his neck and it would then be fixed, it would then be taken from him and fixed to the cross, thus reinforcing the, the deterrent effect of the punishment. But not in this case. It was written by Pilate himself. Now in reading from John 19, verse 17 through 20, and I'm going over there quickly and read that to you. Again, we get a little bit more of a different twist on that. 19.17, it says, And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote the title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Well, didn't the Jews ask him to take it down? We're getting there. <laughs> Misla said, normally... When we just read on, but whenever we, you know, certain scriptures you just read on. You get into the next and it does, nothing pops out. But whenever we stumble or might miss something, the Pharisees usually come to our rescue. <laughs> you know, that's how the Lord uses that. So, all languages flow, they say, towards Jerusalem. So, in Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. And so it says in Hebrew, Yeshua, that's the first word, which is on the right. ha Nazarai, it's the second one. Vimelech, Ha-Jehudim, <coughs> which is on the left. And then it says in John 19.21, if you read on, and that gets where... Uh, Doug just uh, um, talked about. Therefore, the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, you would think, what's the difference? It's very important, actually. And if I would have not done the study, I probably would have been still in the dark too. But it's awesome. <coughs> you and I would have missed this because we don't know Hebrew. But Pilate did what he did deliberately. It was no accident what he wrote, the way he wrote it. John 19.22, basically, he said, What I have written, I have written. But here's the clencher. In the Greek, actually means something slightly different. It just doesn't mean what I have written, I have written. 
it says, what I have written will always remain written. That's what he said. What I have written will always remain written. So what is, what's going on here? A pilot has a game going on. That's what he has going on. Pilate knew that the Jews are into acrostics. You know what acrostics are, right? Psalm 19 is an acrostic. So every line, so you have always, t you have in 22 two groups, it's the alphabet, every line in, the, in Psalm 19 starts with the first letter, the second line, the second letter, and this goes on, and then 22 groups, and it starts over again. This is an acrostic. And it goes all the way through the book of Esther. These are all acrostics. And if you are a Hebrew scholar specifically, you are into acrostics. So he knew that the Jews would not miss what he had done. Because the first letter of each of the word reads Jehovah. First word, Yod. The second one, I have to go back. Ha Nazarene, which is the Nazarene, is the H. Then you have Vimelech, is the the Waf. What it, I think is you pronounce Waf. And then again, Ha Yehudim. You got another Hey. So you have Yad Hey Waf Hey, which is that's exactly. How the Jews call God, or actually, not how they call him, how the rabbis would speak of God, because they wouldn't even pronounce the, the letters. We would say Yahweh, but the Jews wouldn't do that, not the rabbis. So does that mean that Herod came to that conclusion? Well, here's the thing. This is basically the unpronounceable name of God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which nobody really knows how it's pronounced, but it's what it is. Now, we don't know whether Pilate knew that at that very point in time that Christ, that he understood that Christ was the Son of God, but he knew what he did in doing exactly writing in this way would exasperate the Jews and the people that had put him in this predicament. So he did at least... If he didn't know, he at least did it to antagonize the entire Jewish leadership. So, Stephen, so, so every time you see capital L O R D in the Old Testament, that's Yahweh. Yeah. That's what he wrote on there was, was Yahweh. Yeah. Which is, yeah, the yeah. Capital L O R D. Yeah, but just the Jews don't. Yeah, they it, don't. They don't. They'll say it in, um, in, a, in an atmosphere like this where it's respectful. Yeah. Yeah. Respectful religious atmosphere. Yes. They will, they will say it. And, and, and when they study the word of God. They right. Say it. And I so think that's, the, that's the what. The was probably done to antagonize the Jewish Oh, yeah. But, because they're the ones that, you know, they didn't have capital punishment. There's no, no way that they could punish Christ. The Jew, the, the, uh, the. Well, yeah. Christ. The Romans had to. Right. But what he did was basically an incredible thing. You know, that's, that stands for the ages, you know. I mean, that goes into eternity. Like, you know, anything that is, you know, this by design. But uh, again, we know that his wife was already a proselyte and then later became a Christian. And uh, I mentioned it is, you know, that, uh, that uh, the... Um, the Coptic Church, the Egyptian Christian Church, they basically honor both Pilate and his wife. So the, the Lord might have used him or obviously did use him in some metaphor or shape. And he did not budge on it either because he said, hey, what I have written will always be written because he is Yahweh. He is the Lord, you know, period. At the end. Yeah, even though he didn't do his job yeah. in the first place. But again, it had to come because it was already foretold. You know. But regardless. And so what I have written, I have written. I think it's a, a very um, interesting way to see how even uh, 
because we know that in a way Pilate was forced by being more interested in his you know report card to Rome than to do the right thing to be a just judge because that's what he was put there for in the first place but still the Lord used him in, in something incredible and uh, I'm sure that ticked off the Jews quite nicely at this point but go back to their temple and find that the whole curtain has broken that apart. is yeah these are the next things yeah so that's where the Lord is basically just uh, going full steam ahead and tearing down this old system is that that's why it says when he said it's finished it was truly finished you know and uh, we we'll always have to remember that the the Ten Commandments it, they still stand they're still part of God's word the Lord said nothing is gonna pass away not one tittle you know until it all goes basically into eternity if you will because it's his word he established everything it's his word that holds everything together and it's interesting in the uh, uh, the from from point of physics, you know, uh, just when you read in um, uh, what is it here? Just in uh, in Colossians, it's at Colossians one sixteen. Um, it's always interesting to pick that up if you want to talk to somebody about Colossians one sixteen. I think that's where it starts. 115, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, he's talking about Christ, over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Everything is, it is atoms, you can't see the atoms. Even all these things are moving, everything is moving, but we don't see it. You see? The question is, who holds it all together? How come the chair's not falling apart, right? Visible or invisible? Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, why well, even the demons, even Satan, all things were created through him and for him, right? And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. God, you know, years and years ago, they couldn't explain it. They called it uh, atomic, um, not atomic, atomic glue, yeah, because they couldn't figure it out. You know, how is it that even in, you know, in the nucleus, then you have uh, the same, this, the same polarization that should actually push away. But how is it held together? You still can't explain it, right? So they just, they always come up with something. But that's what it says right here. He holds all things together. And I believe when, when but right then, at that moment when he is going to make a new earth and a new heaven, he just lets everything go. Poof. It's gone. And that's how God operates well, I mean, you with everything. Have to figure the earth, the earth, if it tilted out of place one billionth of an inch, the catastrophic would happen. I mean, yes. God has got everything perfect. It's all design. It's all by design. Yeah, that's why I always one. They said uh, if the first and second law of uh, thermodynamics and, uh, and these two laws hangs everything else. And you know what it says. First of all, you can't recreate energy. What is in the system is there, right? Einstein said that. And then the second says, you know, at one point in time, everything was basically at a, at a high level of order, and then it goes, as it goes on, to more and more disorder. So how can evolution then tell you that, oh, we're going from disorder to order? That is completely against, you know, physics. And that's what you see. It's you see it with our lives, you see it with things getting old, with, you know, us, anything is falling apart, the universe, you know, things, that's, I believe there's more stars now burning up than a new created, you know, you see these things, it makes sense, but the Lord says, hey, I still control everything, and until I decide to let go, you know, things just going to go on the way I designed it, and so we don't have to worry about these things. Somehow. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, figurative speaking, yeah, yeah, and so that brings us uh, to the end of uh, that particular, the crucifixion, and then also, not the mystery, but uh, the awesomeness that uh, what Pilate actually did in order to 
you know, make uh, make him make up a little bit for what he messed up in some ways. And we will pick it up next week as we go on into the details that will take us from here now in the people that are on the cross, the soldiers, and then what goes along with the earthquake, the hours of darkness, what happened in the temple, and so on. So it's getting better and better without that. Good. So let's... Uh,